If you take your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of John. I think it's chapter 6. I just remembered Martha's sister passed away a week ago. So Martha is there this morning of Paul Astoria that that service is going on right now. And Reuben and Rosa, are, they're at a funeral too, aren't they, today? Not a relative of theirs, but uh, close. So. Are you ready for the Lord's return? <laughs> He's coming back. He's coming back. Uh, John chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. This morning's message, a little bit different in, in one aspect, at least for me. I'm going to look at seven truths. We're going to look at seven truths to renew your faith. Seven truths to renew your faith. And, and all of us will, will at one time or another face some difficult times in our lives, right? We've done that. And times that are, you can consider very troubling and disturbing and stressful. And it's during these times that we need, we need to hear words of comfort. We need to hear words of hope. And uh, that, that, that's what we need. That's what we're going to look at today. And if, you, if you're one that is going through something or has gone through something, uh, whatever that may be, you need to hear that. If you're one that has not gone through it, and uh, you know, as, 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 as what's happening in our church right now, sometimes it's difficult to find the proper words, right? You ever been there? What do you say? And you say, oh, what can I say? It's so difficult. John 5, or 6, verses 5 and 6. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? This he said to test him, for he, Jesus, knew what he would do. Father, I thank you for your word today, and, and Lord, it is powerful. It is truth, and we need your word. And so, Lord, as we look into it, various portions of scripture today, just may, may our minds grasp what you have to say to us. May we live on that. And, Apply it to our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to look at the various portions of Scripture this morning. And I want to start out with this text here. and we'll, we'll end up with it as well. But we read here of Jesus ministering. or We didn't read the whole story. But he just ministered to, to, to the multitudes of 5,000 plus people. Okay, they all are getting hungry. As probably some of you are right now. And Jesus turns to Philip. And he's asked this question. Where shall we buy bread that these thousands of people can eat? He was saying to him, these thousands of people, Philip, are hungry. Are hungry. How are we going to feed them? This is Jesus talking to Philip. Philip, what are we going to do? Isn't that amazing? Who has the answer? Jesus. And he goes to Philip. He says, what are we going to do, Phil? Did Jesus know what he was going to do? He knew exactly what he was going to do, but he wanted to teach Philip something. Do you think the Lord does the same thing with us? I believe he does too. He knows what he's going to do in your life. He knew what this last week was all, what every, he knew what every day was going to be like for all of us. I'm glad he knows. Because that gives me an assurance. <laughs> I'm not alone. He knows. 
And he knows what he's going to do, but he wants to teach us something. Something that is powerful. He wants to teach you something today and tomorrow that is vitally important to you in your walk with him. Nothing else, but in your walk with Christ. He wants to teach you something. And as you look at the world scene today, I believe, I believe that it's very safe to say that this world is teetering on a precipice as at no other time in its history. Look at what is happening in Egypt. My friends, the world is coming to pieces. It's falling apart. The very foundations of this world are being shaken. But that should not surprise a believer because his word tells us he's going to shake everything that can be shaken. Amen. And there's one thing you need to make sure of in your life, that there is one thing that can't be shaken, and that is your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea what tomorrow holds. And, and believers everywhere are facing trials as never before. We have believers who, who uh, individuals who have no idea who, or, or we, we have no idea how many sit up at night trying to figure out their problems, trying to come up with a solution. Maybe this would work. Uh, no, maybe it won't work. Maybe this one, well, maybe that one. How about this? No, not that. What am I going to do? How many people up all night trying to figure out, what am I going to do? Been there? What am I going to do? And Jesus poses this all-important question. And that's that the point. It's not the feeding the multitude. That's not the point. That the point is his question. And he poses this all-important question to Philip to see one thing. Philip, how are you going to respond to my question? How are you going to respond to the situation? You see this. Our response to various circumstances tell us who or what we really think of Jesus. Let me repeat that. Your response to every situation in your life tells you what you think of Jesus. Do you trust him or do you not? Is he your answer or is your answer somewhere else? You see, your response to your situation answers that question. Oh, I preached a message a year and a half ago uh, on this text. Some of you may remember that message. I know Jake remembers it. Remember the loaves, the fishes, and the leftovers. Jake doesn't like leftovers. That's... Remember the loaves, the fishes, and the leftovers. And in that message, I stated that Philip probably scratched his head and answered, Lord, I've been talking to the other disciples here, and uh, we only have about 200 denarii, and that ain't going to cut it. Lord, we got a food problem here. Well, they had more than a food problem. They had a bakery problem. Who was going to bake all that bread to feed over 5,000 people right now? now? You have more than a food problem, Philip. You've got a bakery problem. And if you can solve that bakery problem, how then on earth are you going to pay for it? Okay, so you've got a money problem. You ever do this with a situation in your life? You start narrowing down, okay, well, 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 can I do this? And I can't, that ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. And if you could buy it, Philip, how are you going to distribute it from the bakeries to the store? How are you going to transport it from the stores to this mountainside? You, Philip, you don't even have time to get the bread. We've got problems. You ever go through a situation and say, so what, do you, what do you do? You say, well, this is impossible, right? This is totally impossible. Feeding this many people, this is impossible. And when, when, when problems come up with that many problems, what are you going to do? And so this situation here, 
your situation, your present situation, whatever it may be. And in the midst of Jesus, of, in your present situation, he comes up to you. And he puts around, his arm around you and he says, uh, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about this? Jesus knows exactly what he's going to do about your situation. And he may come up and put his arm around you and ask you, what are you going to do about this? And he already knows what, what he's going to do about it. He already knows. However, he wants you to know that you are going to have your share of difficulties. <laughs> you didn't need to be told, told that, did you? You're going to have, your, Jesus wants you to know, you're going to have your share of difficulties, so how are you going to handle them? The correct answer for Philip was this. Jesus, you are God. And nothing is impossible. Right, okay. Nothing, Lord, is impossible for you. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm giving this whole bread problem, food problem, transportation problem, I'm going to give it to you. It's no longer my problem. Amen. It's yours. <laughs> You're God. My brother, when he first started this church, and the church is over in a plaza, bought a brand new Plymouth Reliance station wagon. Brand new. Parked out front of the, the kindergarten building and church, and, and some girl was riding her bicycle and hit the front end of it, went up over top, and boom, right on the hood, and put this big dent in it. Somebody came in, came in and told me, somebody hit your car. He goes out there, and he goes, oh, man. He said, Lord, look what she did to your car. <laughs> That's how you deal with it. <laughs> what are you going to do about it, Lord? Isn't everything you, doesn't everything you own belong to him? Yes. There it is. So here's a message today. Jesus wanted Philip to remember his words to him about God's faithfulness. Jesus wants all of us today to remember God's word to us. He has given us powerful words of comfort, powerful words of hope for just a time as a crisis that you are in. He has given you his word. We're going to look at seven of them today. Matthew fifteen thirty-two. Number one. This is a seven-point message, but they're fast points. And that's all they are, just points. Matthew 15, 32. And this is about the same thing, the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus called his disciples to himself, and he said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I don't want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way home. Okay. This statement by Christ is to all believers for every generation. He's telling us this. I am power, and yet I am compassion. I will do more for my people than just heal them. I'm going to make sure they have enough bread to eat. For I am concerned about every detail of their lives. Jesus is concerned about every detail of your life. I want you to realize Jesus is saying to him, I am more than just power, for I am also compassion. And if people see me only as a miracle worker, or if they see me only as a healer, they will fear me. But if you see me as compassionate, if you see God as a giver of good gifts, you will love me and you will trust me. And that is a problem with society today. We don't trust the Lord. Because we don't see him as compassionate. We see him as a man on a throne with a club ready to smack us over the head whenever we do something wrong. There is a day of judgment coming, but we're not living in that age. We're living in the age of grace. Our God is a compassionate God. His mercies are new. 
every morning. His grace is sufficient for you. And when we get a hold of his compassion, we will trust him. And we will love him. God is willing to intervene in the struggles of your life every day. Haven't you told someone going through a struggle something like this? Hang on. Hang on. God is a miracle worker. Have you ever told anybody that God's a miracle worker? God's promises are true. You tell them that. Don't lose hope. He's going to answer your cry. I've told people that all the time. My question for you today is, do you really believe in miracles? Do you really believe? How do you answer that question from the Lord? Most of us would say, yes, Lord. I believe every miracle that I've read in your word. You can do it. I believe it. I believe the question God has for us as a church today right now is this. Do you believe that I can work a miracle for you. Not a miracle for the 4,000 or the 5,000 or, or the blind man or the man with leprosy. Do you believe that God can work a miracle for you? Not just one miracle, but a miracle for every crisis, a miracle for every situation you face. Philip, what are you going to do? You put your own name in there. You see, I don't know about you, I know about me, and, and I need more than this miracle of loaves and fishes. Don't you? You see, I need a miracle for today, not yesterday. Yesterday's gone. I need a miracle today. I need a miracle designed by God for my present situation. Don't you? Don't you need one for this situation? Aren't your other situations are long gone, right? I don't need a miracle for something. God's already done miracles back. That's fine. I need a miracle for this situation. So are you expecting the Lord to work a miracle? Or are you just hoping that he will? You see, that's a question Jesus was asking Philip. It's a question that demands real faith. Real faith. It's a faith that, well, when you put it in the hands of the Lord, it quiets your heart. That kind of faith. When you finally surrender it all, it causes all wars in your spirit to end and to cease. It's over with. Get that faith. If you get that faith, you can rest in the Father's love, trusting Him to come through for you every day. Set so point two. Our faith is a great testimony. Hebrews 11, 2. By their faith, the elders obtained a good report or a, a great testimony. By what? Their faith, they gave a good testimony. Now, the word obtained here means to bear witness, to become a testimony. So by their faith, they became a testimony, a walking, living testimony about what? About God's faithfulness. You are right now, sitting right here, going to work tomorrow should the Lord tarry, you are a testimony. Amen. You're either a lousy one or you're a good one. Can believers have a lousy testimony? Don't answer this, but here's a good question. Have you ever been a lousy testimony to the keeping power of Christ? You are a testimony, and I beg of you to be a godly one. <laughs> be be a, a, a one that, has, a, that is a, an example of, of true faith in the living God. One thing we know about the great men and women of the Bible is that they had a settled anchored faith in the Almighty God. Nothing could shake it. And their unwavering faith became a testimony to the world of God's faithfulness in the midst, not in the midst of good times, but in the midst of lousy, rotten, troubled times, they had a good testimony. See, that's when your character is put to the test, isn't it? When you go through the fire. Ooh, like the three Hebrew children. 
going through the fire. Wow. So how did these great men and women of God obtain a good testimony? How did they get that? It was through what they had endured. That's how you get it. What you go through. They went through what? They go through floods? These, if you read through Hebrews chapter 11, it tells you they went through mockery. You ever been mocked? And you went home and you just cried and cried and cried and cried. Nobody loves me, Lord. And you just whined and whined and whined. Get over it. These guys went through floods. They went through mockery. They went through handcuffs. They went through chains. They went through imprisonment. They went through fire. They went through torture. They went through warfare. They went through lion's dens. They went through being sawed in half in a log. They went through crucifixions and through, through all of these things. And some things that we don't even know about they went through. Their faith in God never wavered. Never wavered. Our faith in God begins to waver when our brakes start to squeak. Our faith in God begins to waver when our, our gas tank gets lower, when there's only one more can of beans in the cupboard. Our faith in God begins to waver when we only got a half a gallon of milk. Our faith in God begins to waver and we haven't even touched what great men and women of God are. Until you get past that half a gallon of milk, you're going to hit that half a gallon of milk every week. Until you finally give it to the Lord. <laughs> One of our senior pastors in the state, John Bunny, going through Bible college. I don't know how many kids he had. He went through at an older age. Just gave up everything. Going through Bible college. No money. The kids to feed. He tells a story. He knew they were out of milk, but the milk never ran dry. He asked his wife about this milk. She said, John, she said, it fills up every day. It never empties out. I want that kind of a milk jug. <laughs> I have that kind of milk jug. His name is Jesus. Put that kind of faith into action. All of these men and women of God, you may ask the question, how did their faith not waver? You see, all of them had an inner witness that God was well pleased with them. They knew that God was looking upon them with, with a well done. You have believed and you have trusted in me. Well done. I'm reminded of the three Hebrew children. I preached this a few weeks ago. They made a statement of faith to Nebuchadnezzar. Our God will deliver us. That was their statement of faith. Then they made a statement of commitment. And that statement of commitment said, And if he doesn't, we're still not serving your God. <laughs> My God will deliver me. And if he doesn't, I'm still going to serve him. That's where we lose our faith. We say, God, get me through this and I'll serve you. No. God, whatever your will is for me makes no difference. I'm never going to waver in my faith. And they made that commitment of faith to the... They made a commitment. We need to make commitment. Anybody can make a statement. Right? Words are cheap, are they not? Words are cheap. Anybody can say anything. God wants a commitment from your heart. That's what he wants. And so you commit it. Lord... Even if you don't fill up my milk jug, I'm still going to serve you. And when they made that commitment of faith, God was honored. Because they said, we don't make it, don't make it difference, Nebuchadnezzar. You can do to us whatever you want to do. My faith in God is not wavering. Young people, hear me today. Because the world is after your faith. He's after your faith. If he gets your faith, he gets your soul. Don't waver your faith in the living God. Are you diligently God? God says he is a rewarder, is he not? He's a rewarder of them who diligently... What was that last word you said? Him? Those who diligently seek him. Are you diligently seeking the Lord today? Or are you diligently seeking his blessing? 
is a vast difference. Because if you're diligently seeking his blessing, you're going to lose your faith. If you're diligently seeking the Lord, he's going to reward you. And whenever we hold our faith position through hard times, we receive the same affirmation from the Holy Spirit. Well done. You are God's beloved testimony to a lost and a dying world. And as you rest in Christ through the storms of your life, holding your position of faith, you are obtaining a good testimony to a lost and a dying world. You are a beacon of hope when this world has fallen to pot. You are a beacon of hope all around you. Those who are watching your life are learning that hope is also available to them just as you have it. And if you proclaim hope with your mouth, And your actions, there is none. They look at you and say, I don't want your God. I'll go to some palm reader. People are flocking to palm readers left and right. It's time that we as true believers of Jesus Christ start giving a good testimony. A good testimony. Oh, I can read my astrology thing in a jigger. No, you can't. You're starting to dabble in a demonic. Oh, it's just for fun. <laughs> That's what Satan wants you to think. All he wants. See, all he's looking for is just a little crack. He can get his claw in there and yank you right through. Run from those tea leaf readers as fast as you can run. Well, you don't have to be afraid of them. But just... Well, say a word of prayer over them. Lord, save their soul. Don't dabble in that garbage. It's satanic. And I know I get in a heap of trouble when I say that, but it ain't the first time. And as the people observe your faith in the hour of your crisis, and uh, Jessica, I applaud you. It wasn't an easy thing for you to do this morning. She's a strong woman. I'll let you know that as your pastor. And when people see you, Jessica, stand like you're standing in the hour of your crisis, they will say there stands someone who hasn't lost their faith in the living God. Amen. And they have no fear whatsoever. What enables them to trust through such upheaval in their lives? I'll tell you what enables them to trust. The one true God. He enables us. The living one who reigns and has supplied every one of his children with everything that they need to sustain your faith. There is no reason for your faith to be diminished. Because Christ has given you everything to sustain it. Even if calamities continue to arise worldwide, you and I have been given the witness of the Holy Spirit who abides in us. And God's fully revealed written word to us. These things will sustain us even as the world shakes to its very foundations. Number three, Nehemiah 4.14. Have you ever been, we have a weapon against fear. Aren't you glad? Have you ever been overcome with fear? I've got three glasses of water up here. Make sure i got the right one. <laughs> Who hasn't been overcome with fear? When that happens, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we must remind ourselves of how great our God is. Remind yourself of how great God is. We are to recall all of God's great deliverances in the past. And for, for those who have been trusting in Him... Remember those, that great cloud of witnesses and those who have claimed the same majestic power... For their trials, you claim that same majestic power for your trial. And here's a quote I want you to get a hold of today. Fear cannot get a stranglehold on any servant of God who has a vision of God's greatness and His majesty. And if fear has a grip on you, then you don't have a grip on Jesus. Somebody's got to change, and it's you 
and me. If you are a servant of God and your eyes are upon his majesty and his greatness, fear has nothing to do with you. Nehemiah knew this very well. He walked back and forth working on rebuilding the wall. We can read it in Nehemiah of Jerusalem. He was surrounded by enemies. And you may feel like you're surrounded by enemies. And, and these, these worn out workers had a hammer, what, in one hand and a, and a sword in the other hand. And, 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 and they were working that way. And, 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 all, and all the other time, as, as time ticked by, they began to get a little scared, a little worried. And you say, how, how are they able, even in that midst, to be, to, able, to be able to resist the fear that they had to be feeling? Well, Nehemiah reminded them in, in the 14th verse of chapter 4 of how great and mighty their God is. Is your God great and mighty? Or are you serving some stick of wood? What are you serving? Some molded plastic thing called a TV? What are you serving? What are you serving? And Nehemiah says, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. He is great and he is terrible. Remember the Lord and fight on. Amen. Remember the Lord and fight for your faith. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Moses, that's how he dealt with the fear in Israel. He told them, if you say, this is really good, if you say in your heart that these nations are greater than us, you shall not be afraid of them, but... So if you're thinking, this problem is bigger than I can handle, he said, don't be afraid of that problem. Don't be afraid of that situation. Remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh. Remember what he did to the whole nation of Egypt. Remember his awesome power. Remember how he, he opened up the Red Sea. Don't fear, for the Lord your God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. He'll fight for you. That's how Moses dealt with it. You may wonder, how you'll survive? How will I gain a victory? But all you need to do is remember, here's our weapon against fear, the awesome power of Almighty God. That's your weapon. Remind yourself of who God is. Remind yourself of what He has done. Remind yourself of how faithful He is. He must be your praise. He must be your worship. We find out in our nation how, how mighty God is when, when really spectacular sporting events come up, such as next week. Right? Hey, it's only one Sunday at night of the year. Let's cancel church because the Super Bowl's on. Well, we'll only do that if the Browns make it, so we're never going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I said that for Elaine. We will never cancel church to watch some overpaid athlete make an idiot of himself. Okay. God must be our praise and be our worship. Not what the world has to offer. And if your faith is shaken, remember who God is. And you'll find every grip of fear being broken by a vision of God's majesty. Number four, we have a weapon against despair. Job says in 31, 35, Oh, that someone would hear me. You ever been there? Wives? Oh, that someone would hear me. <laughs> in the midst of Severe upheavals in people's lives. Many believers have been robbed of their faith by those trials. They were once vibrant believers, but their belief turned into feelings of hopelessness and despair. And many begin to wonder, why doesn't God answer my prayers? You ever ask that question? Have I done something wrong? You ever ask that question? I don't understand why my trial goes on and on and on and on and on. It's like the ever-ready bunny. It's like the, the song that never ends. How does that song go? Oh, it's the song. Okay. Shaw knows it. Okay. Why does this thing keep going on and on and on and on? Is the Lord mad at me? You ever ask that question? Lord, are you mad at me? Job's friends were messengers of despair. And he spoke these words. 
Oh, that someone would hear me while surrounded by his so-called friends who had no sympathy for his troubles. Believers who are messengers of despair are not true believers. You see, for as a child of God, I have a message of life. I have a message of hope. That message is Jesus Christ. So whenever I become a message of despair, smack me. Because I've lost my salvation somewhere along the line. Because that's, that, I'm God's messenger. And God's not a God of despair. God is not a God of hopelessness. He's a God of life. He's a God of good things. He's a God of comfort and a God of hope. So Job turned to the Lord when he had all these buddies around him. And he turned to the Lord alone and he, and he turned to him and said, Behold, my witness is in heaven. My record is on high. My eyes pour tears unto God. David had a similar cry when he had this large family and all these friends by his side. He said in Psalm 62, 8, with all these people around him, to whom shall I go? Trust in him at all times, he told Israel. Pour out your heart before the Lord, your God, for he is a refuge for you. Not all this. God is. And these examples and more are given to us by the Lord as invitations urging you and me to find a private place where we can pour out to God the troubles of our soul. Job and David poured out their complaints to God, and so must you, and so must I pour my complaint out to God. Don't get on the telephone and pour out your complaint to somebody else. That's ungodly. And when somebody, when you answer the phone and that person's pouring out their complaints to you, you say, oh, wait a minute, the pastor said, that's ungodly. You want to keep on going? I don't think so. <laughs> it is ungodly. Tell the Lord how discouraged you are, how overwhelmed the current situation is for you. God has, and God continues to answer the cries of all who have trusted in his promises. He will hear your cry with love. He will hear your cry with sympathy. And then he will renew your strength for every battle you're in. Number five, resign yourself to God's care. Luke 21 25 and 26. I'm not going to read these, but Jesus warns here of perilous times. He said, perilous times are coming. He didn't say Cairo, Egypt, but we can put it right in there. He's basically telling us without hope in me, all you thousands and millions of people are literally going to die of fright and fear. But those who trust in God, and trust in His Word and in His promises to, to preserve His people. Has God not promised to preserve His people? Somebody knows. Has God promised to preserve His people? Yes, He has. And so the God who has promised to preserve His people, and if you're His people, you have a glorious freedom from all fear. Amen. So resign yourself to the care of God. So how can this be? True freedom consists of totally resigning your life into the hands of the Lord. How is that done, Pastor? It's done by an act of faith. An act of faith. It means put yourself completely under His power, under His wisdom, under His mercy. Be led according to, to His will, not your will. And if we do these things, God promises to be totally responsible to feed you, to clothe you, and to shelter you. And to guard your heart from all evil. God has promised to do that for you. So why are you worried about what you're going to eat? You know how many Christians are so worried about the end times right now? That they're just scattered. They're filling up their basements with food. Lord, help them. And I know it's a popular thing. To, don't get caught up in that stuff. My God is able to provide my every need. The ultimate example is Christ when he went to the cross. Before he gave up his spirit, he cried out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. What did he just do? He entrusted to the Father his very life. He entrusted to the Father 
his eternity. He entrusted to the Father the custody of himself. And in so doing, he placed the souls of each of his sheep, which I'm one, into the Father's hands. There's two. You've been entrusted into the care of your Father's hands through Jesus Christ if you would just do that. And if we are being asked to trust our lives to someone else, we, we, we better know that that someone has the power to keep us. We better know that that someone has the power to keep me from danger and threats and violence. And Paul said to Timothy in chapter, the second book in chapter 1, somewhere through there he said, I know through all of these things, through all that I've gone through, nevertheless, I know in whom I have believed. And he is able to keep me. He is able to keep me. He is able to keep me. He said, I am persuaded. <laughs> I've committed everything to him. Everything. In verse number six, live in the fear of and the awe of the Lord. God, right now, is shaking the nations. And He's going to shake them even harder. And He may even shake the church. Because you see, the Lord is coming back soon. And He's not coming back for a people who have wrinkles. I'm not talking about age, I'm talking about your lifestyle. But if you're coming back for those without wrinkles, I ain't going to make it. I got wrinkles all over. Those who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, that's who he's coming back for. And he's coming back soon. And when God shakes all the nations, Ezekiel says, We're going to be greatly tempted to fear. He says, Can your heart endure or can your hands be strong in the days that I will deal with you? God warned Noah of his coming, coming judgment. He told him to build an ark. Hebrews eleven seven 7 tells us Noah was moved with fear. David in Psalm 119, 120 admitted, My flesh trembles for fear of you, the Lord, and I'm afraid of your judgments. Habakkuk saw distress, disastrous days ahead of him, and he cried out, When I heard about what's going to happen, my belly trembled. My belly's trembling right now, but it's more because I'm hungry. He said, my lips quivered at your voice, O Lord. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. Now note that the, the, the fear in each of these godly men was not a, a fleshly fear, but a reverential awe of the Lord. They knew what he was going to do. And I'm going to tell you this. When God shakes this world, which he's doing, if that doesn't cause you to fear the Lord's judgments, then may he have mercy on you. What am I saying? I'm saying you better make yourself right with God. That's what I'm saying. And if you don't think you need to, you're in trouble. You see, these guys weren't afraid of the enemy of their souls. They weren't afraid of the situation. I'm not afraid of what's happening in the world. But am I right with God? Lord, I want to be able to stand with you. They feared God's righteous judgments. That is because they understood the awesome power behind the approaching calamities. They didn't fear the outcome of the storm. They feared God's holiness. That's what they feared. And each of us will experience overwhelming fear when trouble hits his heart. But our fear must come from a holy reverence for the Lord, never from a fleshly anxiety over the situation and over, even over our fate. You see, all over the world, people are, are filled with this fleshly fear as they, they see things falling apart. And they are afraid that they're going to lose everything. But that is a cry of unbelievers who have no hope. That should never be the cry of the believer. You should never cry out, I'm going to lose everything. Oh, because if I have Christ, I have 
everything. What's a material possession that's going to rot and decay anyways? If you're saved today, your Heavenly Father will not endure such unbelief in you. Isaiah has warned us. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man that will die and of a son of another man who which shall be made like grass and forget the Lord your God? Why are you fearing man and forgetting God? Who are you that you do that? And has feared continually every day because of the fury of, of the oppressor. That's good stuff. Who are you, in other words, if you fear man and forget God? Let me put it this way. If you're fearing man, you have forgotten God. If you're fearing man and you have forgotten God, <laughs> I'd say you're not where you need to be in your relationship with Jesus Christ if you even have one. Isaiah 8.13, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your awe. We are to let God be our fear and our awe. That kind of fear leads not to death but to life. And lastly this morning, number seven, delight yourself in the Lord. Psalm 37.4, When you resign yourself truly and fully into the hands of God, you will have abiding peace no matter the circumstance you're going through. David said, delight yourself in the Lord, or whoever wrote that psalm, and will give you the desires, he will give you the desires of your heart. So if you have resigned yourself into the Lord's hands, he is going to empower you to endure any hardship that you may go through. And I've said it time and time again already this morning, Jessica is a strong woman. It's not because of anything special about Jessica, it's about the Holy Spirit that is in her. He has allowed her to endure this. And his desire is that you go about your daily business without fear and without anxiety because you are trusting in the care of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And your resignation to him will have a very practical effect in your life. And the more resigned you are to God's care, the more indifferent you will be to the conditions around you. So if this world, what's happening, this world is shaking you up, then I tell you, you better get on your knees because your faith is next. And get that truth today. I'm going to say it again. The more resigned you are to God's care, the more indifferent you will be to the conditions around you. And I'm not saying you'll be indifferent to people. I'm not saying that. You will be indifferent to to the circumstances around you. I don't know about you, but I know this world is headed for a heap of trouble. <laughs> I know it. How do you know that? The Bible tells me. But I also know God says he'll keep his people through it. So what am I going to stand on? I know it's all going to happen. I'm standing on his word. If you are resigned to his keeping power, you won't be scared by any terrible news. And if you get scared by terrible news, keep the TV off. If you're resigned to his keeping power, you won't constantly be trying to figure out the next step in your life. If you are resigned to his keeping power, that means you have entrusted your life to Christ. You have entrusted your family to Christ. You have entrusted your future to Christ. You have entrusted it all into his safe and loving hands. If you have resigned yourself to his keeping power. Our great shepherd, Jesus Christ, knows perfectly how to protect his sheep. Doesn't he? He knows perfectly how to protect you. He knows perfectly how to provide for you. He knows perfectly how to keep you. He knows perfectly how to preserve his flock, doesn't he? Our great shepherd leads his flock in love, not with a whip, not with a club. He leads you in love. Musicians, if you'd come. So how great is our God? We have to sing that song. It just kind of fits. We need to know, be remember, reminded of how great our God is. So in closing today, going back to John 6, right? 
6, 5, and 6. I think I'd remember that by now. Jesus asked Philip this question. What do you think we should do? What do you think we should do, Phil? When you're going through your situation in your life, worship team, you can come as well. When you're going through a situation in your life, the Lord may ask you that question, what do you think we should do? I want you to know God already has the answer. The Lord already has a plan. Sean, <laughs> with your business, Lord, what are you going to do? When jobs, I know I've been through my dad's business. When jobs seem to like, oh, 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 I'm down to one. Oh, he always comes, doesn't he? He always, he always comes through. He, he, always, he always has asked my dad. He's been in it since, how old am I? 50, 54 years. That's how long he's been. And he has seen more ups and downs than roller coasters I've been on. And he will tell you, God always comes through. Well, why does he always come through for some and not for some others? Well, you've got to be obedient to his word. You've got to be obedient. So, Philip, what do you think we should do? And may our response be this. Lord, you're the miracle worker. I surrender all my doubts to you. I surrender all my fears to you. You can begin playing if you would. I entrust you with what? This entire situation. I give it to you. It's in your care. I entrust my whole life into your care. I know you will not allow me to faint. Didn't God say that in one of the scriptures we read? Jesus said, I don't want them to go home hungry lest they... He didn't even want them to faint. He doesn't want you to faint today. So he's given you his word. So you won't faint. Let's stand this morning. It's not you asking Jesus what we're going to do. Jesus put his arm around you saying, what are we going to do? Aren't you glad he said we? He said, what are, what are we going to do this? We just say, Lord, I trust in your power. Amen and amen. Amen. So this morning, if you are in fear wrong kind of fear. If you're worried about things, if your faith is being shaken, the Lord is telling us today, I have a plan already in place. What are you going to do about it? And our answer is, Lord, I'm going to give it to you. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to want to give everything to the Lord today. Everything. Amen. Both hands up. Everything. Yeah. Amen. So he wants you to know today his word to you. Get into his word and know the promises of God. Remember how mighty God is. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great. Are you giving a good testimony? How many want to be able to give a better testimony to the lost? I want to give a better testimony. How great is our God. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. The splendor of the King. Oh, lift your hands and lift your voices to the Lord this morning. Lord in and if fear has a grip on you, just give yourself. Let all the earth rejoice. Oh, let him take it. All the earth rejoice. Oh, surrender it all to Christ today. He wraps himself. Oh, Let darkness Christ to Oh, you can trust in Him today. 
trembles at his voice. Oh, I trembles at his voice. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. is Shall come. 
when Christ shall come. He's coming soon. He's coming we soon. Of acclamation and take me home. Oh, what joy Amen. shall fill, shall fill my heart. Then I Thank shall bow. Oh, yes, I am. Hallelujah. Hey, If you would come to the front this morning. Just have some women gather around here. Pray for you and your kids. I know they're praying for your kids back there, so just face me if you would. Face me. Face me. I know that's could be hard. <laughs> Don. Thank you, Lord. We're just going to close the service in a prayer. Pray for Jessica. Her kids. And Jessica, keep your eyes on the Lord. And remember how great God is. And the rest of us, remember how great God is. Remember how great God is. And remember our lives are just a vapor. Also know that the death of one of his saints is, is blessed in the eyes of God. Because he longs for us to be with him. Not just in spirit, but in body as well. Father, thank you for this woman. Lord, you have filled her with your spirit in such a way that she is strong beyond our understanding. And Lord, you have given her wisdom. I've seen that as well. Lord, her children now need a father. And Jessica needs a husband. And Lord, you are the one. And Father, use your body today, which we are members of. Father, just to pour out love to her and to her kids. Lord, to pour out wisdom and direction. Lord, to pour out assistance unto her. Father, your word tells us to take care of the widows and the fatherless. And Lord, you have blessed us with that today. And Father, may we as a church be found faithful in our task to you. And Father, we know that you'll be faithful in keeping her and guarding her. And so, Lord, put a wall of protection up around her that no enemy may come in and steal anything. Lord, anything. Anything. And so, Lord, just keep them all at bay while you do a work in this family. Raise them up. Raise up disciples. Raise up those three boys and Emma. Lord, to be great ministers of your gospel. Lord, that only you can do. And Father, we give you the praise and we give you the glory. And we love you. We love you, Lord. We love you. And we recognize your power and your majesty. And you are our all in all. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And the whole body of Christ said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. The Lord is good all the time. He is so faithful. So faithful. Praise his holy name. Lord bless you. Have a great day. 
and the service tonight, youth, young adult, children, adult, and then Wednesday night, our, our uh, celebration of life service for Harold. <laughs> 